Every October, my dad makes a scarecrow and puts it in the cornfield on our farm in Fallbrook to keep away the crows and the evil spirits. But this particular October, it was my turn to make the scarecrow. So I took hours upon hours till it was perfectly creepy and scary, the ugliest scarecrow anyone's ever seen. And as I was finishing up, my mom called me in for dinner. So I put the scarecrow out in the cornfield in a good spot right where I can see it outside my bedroom window. And that night it started to rain and thunder and it was gonna be a rough night of weather. So I go to my room and I look outside and what I see shocked me. The scarecrow was there, but it wasn't where I left it. You see, every time the lightning struck, it was in a different place, as if it moved in the darkness. Uncertain, I went to bed, scared, hoping it would not come for me. And then I heard a loud crack. And I decided to go outside, check on my scarecrow, because it was nowhere to be seen from my bedroom window. As I'm walking outside, I fall over on a branch to the ground, face in the mud. And I look up, and there is a scarecrow, red eyes, staring at me. I ran into my house, afraid, screaming, never to see the scarecrow again. Okay, okay, that was a, a ghost story, and we're going to be talking about some ghost stories today, but um, before we jump into it, let's just turn these theatrics off, am I right? In the month of October that we're in right now, everywhere you look, on Netflix, on Hulu, on your Kindle app book suggestions, at pumpkin patches, you can't avoid these things. And to be honest, I try to avoid these things because they're creepy and they're scary and they give me the heebie-jeebies and goosebumps. And that would be ghost stories. What you just heard, a ghost story. That story was not true at all. But it's a ghost story that freaks you out. It's uncertain. You're not sure if it's real or true. It's mystical, magical. Um, ghost stories like about the guy named Johnny. Ghost stories about the scarecrow. Jo ghost stories about the big toe that was eaten. They're everywhere, you can find them. And some of us, maybe you're like me, who's a scaredy cat, tries to avoid them at all costs because you don't know if it's real, you don't know if it's fake, you don't know what to believe, or you just don't know about it. And actually, there's some ghost stories in the Bible that a lot of Christians avoid because they don't know what it is, who it is, or anything really much about it. And this month, we're gonna be diving into our own ghost stories about the Holy Ghost also known as the Holy Spirit. See, this month we're gonna be diving into looking at who or what is the Holy Spirit, what does the Holy Spirit do, and how does this apply to me and my life? And so today we're gonna to dive right into one of the most famous ghost stories about the Holy Spirit. So if you have your Bibles, we're gonna be in Acts chapter two. In Acts chapter two, um, we're gonna look at this ghost story. Don't worry, I won't use the light. <laughs> we'll be fine. Um, but it starts in verse one. It says, when the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each of them. Then they were all filled, filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were Jews seen in Jerusalem, devout people from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound occurred, a crowd came together and were confused because each one heard them speaking in their own language. They were astonished and amazed. Now this is a little different of a ghost story, but this is one of the most famous stories when the Holy Spirit comes and um, tongues of fire are put on top of the disciples and the people following Jesus and suddenly they can speak in all these different languages. This would probably be one of the top ghost stories if we were to put it on Netflix or Hulu. But it's one of the stories that talks about who the Holy Spirit is. And it's honestly one of the most famous ones. But people forget that the Holy Spirit arrived in the Bible way before that. You see, if you turn all the way to your front of your Bible, the Holy Spirit is there at verse 2, the very beginning of creation. You see, in Genesis 1, 2, it says, The earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the water. See, we see that the Spirit was there at the very beginning. We see within the whole Old Testament, this part of the Bible, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, he um, is present in the lives of judges and warriors and kings, um, giving them power to do extraordinary things or to give them extraordinary truth. And then we see when Jesus comes, Jesus in the New Testament, gets baptized and heaven opens up and a, a dove descends. The Spirit of God comes in the form of a dove and descends upon Jesus. 
And we also hear Jesus talking and describing uh, this Holy Spirit, this Holy Ghost. Um, and he says in John 14, um, 15, he said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper who will be with you forever. That helper is the Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because he does not see or know him. You know him because he lives with you and in you. And what's crazy is Jesus is describing this Holy Spirit that's going to come, which we just read the ghost story of him finally coming after Jesus leaves and goes back to heaven. And in the Bible, it talks about how he is greater than Jesus because he can dwell and live among us. He's here among us, this Holy Ghost, this Holy Spirit. But if I'm being honest, growing up, I avoided talking about the Holy Spirit because it sounded kind of magical, mystical. Is it like the force in Star Wars? Is it like this thing in your brain that you think about? Is it magical? Because that's not real, right? It just, the supernatural, the Holy Spirit, it was something I avoided because I didn't know much about it. And one of the main things I didn't know about it is the question of, is the Holy Spirit a who or a what? And today we're going to talk about if the Holy Spirit is a who or a what and why that matters to us personally as Christians. So the first thing for you to know is the Holy Spirit, a he, a she, is it a ghost that floats a fire on top of the heads? Is it a force? I mean, we saw a lot of different things in the Old Testament, uh, some verses and things I just brought up. But the main thing to know is, is the Holy Spirit a who or what? The answer is the Holy Spirit is a who. The Holy Spirit is a who. We know this because of the Trinity. So we're going to get a little theological here. The Trinity, you think of a triangle here. And the Trinity, we have um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You see, the Bible talks about how we have one God, one God in three persons, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They were all equal, um, but they are not the same. They're all equal. So it's one God in three persons. Something that's really hard for us to grasp, something that we're never fully going to understand. Um, it's going to sound a little bit like a paradox, really, but um, God is so great and so big that we can't fully understand, but all throughout scripture we see it is clear. There is one God in three persons. Not three gods, one God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is one of those persons in the Trinity. Um, so one of the great ways I like to explain this is when you say one God, three persons, it's not one plus one plus one equals three. Think of it more as one times one times one equals one. Um, that is the Trinity there. And the Trinity definition talks about how it is one God in three persons. And when we say the word person, we're not talking about like a human being like me. We're talking about someone who is personal, how you can do relational things. So all throughout scripture, when you look at who the Holy Spirit is, when you look at some of these ghost stories, these appearances, these sightings, these ghost sightings, um, we see things like in Acts 8, where he speaks to a man named Philip. In Acts 15, where the Holy Spirit makes decisions. We see in Ephesians 4, that the Holy Spirit can be grieved and can be saddened. We see in Hebrews 10, the Holy Spirit can be outraged and mad. We can see in Acts 5 that he can be lied to. He has life. He has will. He's all-knowing. He's all-present. All of these attributes cannot be for just something like the Star Wars force. The Holy Spirit has all these attributes of personhood, can perform the actions of person, and has personal relationships. And when we refer to the Holy Spirit, um, one of the things that really made me uncomfortable growing up is what do I, how do I refer to him? Do I say it, like it, the Holy Spirit? Well, the Bible is very clear it's a per that the Holy Spirit is a person, so we don't refer to the Holy Spirit as it, but it teaches us to use the masculine, um, masculine relational terms of he. So as we're moving forward in this new series, Ghost Stories, we're going to refer to the Holy Spirit as he. And so... We just looked at, there's proof all throughout scripture, all throughout the Bible. Um, don't take my word for it. Go dive into it yourself. That the Holy Spirit is the third part person in the Trinity, the one God, the triune God, who is a person, a he. So why does that matter that he's a who and not a what, like a force, an it? Well, it matters for three reasons that I want to dive into today. And the first reason has to do with relationships. See, we can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. A relationship that is eternal and a relationship that is perfect. See, the coolest thing about the Trinity is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're in perfect unity, perfect relationship, perfectly loving one another. They're the model, the Trinity, the Trinity, the one God, the three persons, is the model of what Christianity is supposed to be, how we're supposed to um, love others, how we're supposed to love God, this perfect union of one God in three persons, perfectly relational. Um, and so, it talks about how the Holy Spirit can actually have relationship. We can have relationship with him, one that is perfect out of perfect love. 
Um, one that the Bible describes the Holy Spirit as the great counselor, the great helper, someone we can pray to, not just this mystical force off there, someone we can have relationship one with, a relationship that's perfect and eternal. Because we can have relationships here on earth with our mom and dad, but those aren't perfect. With our friends, that's definitely not perfect. But a relationship with one of the persons of the Trinity, the one God, one person, um, in the Trin one God, three persons, the one person in the Trinity we can have relationship with. The second reason why this is important that the Holy Spirit is a who and not a what is because it reminds us that we are never alone. Never alone. In the Old Testament, when you read the Old Testament, it talks about um, God, the Spirit of God, and where it dwelled. And it dwelled in the temple, specifically the Ark of the Covenant. And the Israelite people would carry it around wherever they went. And so it was kind of like the Spirit of God was that's where it was known to be. But in the Old Test, in the New Testament, when Jesus comes and fulfills the laws and fulfills promises and covenants, he promises that the Holy Spirit now lives within us. See, in 1 Corinthians, it says that our body as a Christian is now the temple. So the Holy Spirit literally dwells inside of us, meaning we're never alone. And, and we receive the Holy Spirit. It tells us in Acts 2.38 that repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that moment of salvation when you choose to step over that line of like, I believe this gospel message, this good news that Jesus died on the cross, rose again. He's my Lord and Savior of my life. I'm going to repent, turn away from my sin, and turn towards God. You receive the gift of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, the new temple. And wherever we go in life, we are never alone. We have the Spirit of God in us. And the third reason why it's important to know that the Holy Spirit is a who, not a what, is because we have no reason to fear. No need to fear anything in this life or death. And I love this verse in Romans 8 that I want to leave you guys with that says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. We have nothing to fear in this life. We can't fear COVID, we can't fear loneliness, we can't fear sickness, death, bullying. We have nothing to fear because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of us. So we don't have to fear this life when the struggles and the heartache and the, the things come. You'll feel them, but you don't have to live in fear because you have the spirit of God in you. And when the ultimate struggle the cost of sin, which is death, comes. You don't have to fear because the Spirit of God lives in you. And it says whoever has the Spirit of God, whoever's a Christian, is saved and gets to live in eternity. Continue this relationship we have, this perfect relationship in eternity in heaven. That is who the Spirit is. Someone that we can have a relationship with. Someone who does not leave us alone as Christians. And someone who helps us overcome fear. And next week, we're going to be talking about more of this, who this Holy Spirit is. We're going to be diving into what does he do exactly? What is his role? I mean, we talk about Jesus. His role was to save us from sins, die on the cross. The Father, um, it's very clear that his role was in creation. So what is the role of the Holy Spirit? And so next week, we're going to dive into that. So this week, I'm going to pray for us, and I hope that you um, take comfort in knowing that you have the Holy Spirit who loves you, cares for you, lives inside you, never alone, has a relationship with you. Let's pray. God, thank you so much that we can dive into this ghost story of the Holy Spirit, the, the, that we have one God, you are one God in three persons, Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that um, your Holy Spirit is someone that we can have a relationship with. Your Holy Spirit is um, someone who we don't have to fear, don't have to live in fear because of, someone who and we don't have to feel alone because your Holy Spirit is with us as Christians, God. Help us to continue um, to seek you as we jump into this series of um, living with the Spirit, Lord. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.